Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter number 13, Dhritarashtra quits home, text number 28. I think it's on the board, right? Yes. Atori Chemi Samyato, Atori Chemi Samyato,
for a life of frustration by becoming a dira or leaving home for good without communicating with relatives. And Vidura advised his eldest brother to adopt this way without delay because very quickly the age of Kali was approaching. A condition soul is already degraded by the material association and still in the Kali Yuga the good qualities of a man will deteriorate to the lowest standard. He was advised to leave home before Kali Yuga approached because the atmosphere which was created by Vidura is valuable with is, is valuable instruction of the facts of life would fade away due to the influence of the age which was fast approaching. To become Narotama or a first class human being, depending completely on the Supreme Lord Sri Krishna is not possible for any ordinary man. It is stated in Bhagavad Gita 728 that a person who is completely relieved of all things of sinful acts can alone depend on the Supreme Lord Sri Krishna, personality of body. Dhritarashtra was advised by Vidura at least to become a dira in the beginning. If it, if, if it were impossible for him to become a sannyasi or a narottama, persistently endeavoring of the line of self relations helps a person to rise to the conditions of a narottama from the stage of a dira. The dira stage is attained after prolonged practice of yoga system, but by the grace of Vidura, one can attain the stage immediately simply by willing to adopt the means of the dira stage, which is the preparatory stage for sannyasi. The sannyasi stage is the preparatory stage of Paramahamsa or first great devotee of the Lord. That's the end of the Om Ajnana Timarandasya Kananjana Shalakaya Atsur Milikandena Tasman Shri Guru Venama Shri Chaitanya Mano Vishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Bande Ham Shri Guru Shri Yata Padakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavam Shya Shri Rupam Sakrachatam Sahagana Raghunatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Sapadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishaka Nitamstra He Krishna Karna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpati Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namastate Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrinda Vanishwari Vrishabhanu Sudevi Pranamami Hari Triye Vanchakalpata Rupyasya Kripa Sindhu Maye Vacha Padita Nama Vani Vyo Vaishnavi Vyo Namo Nama Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Atreita Gadarha, Shri Vasari Gorvatarinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare So we're hearing Vidura give instructions to his brother Dhritarashtra of course, Dhritarashtra was born blind. He was blind materially and he was also blind spiritually. But he was blessed to have a brother who was actually Yamaraj. Vidura is Yamaraj come to take part in the pastimes of Lord Krishna. So, 
Vidura, where he is one of the Mahajans, is an authority on devotional service. That is the Jyamaraj, he's an authority on devotional service. And so when he comes as Vidura, he was conceived by the semen of Vyasadeva in the womb of a sudra, in the, in the womb of one of the sudra maidservants in the palace. But he has a relationship of brother with Dhritarashtra. There was Pandu and Dhritarashtra and Vidura. They were all conceived by Srila Vyasadeva because Srila Vyasadeva was the brother of, well, he was like a brother of Vichitra He was the son of Satyavati. And Satyavati, uh, before her marriage, she had given birth to Vyasadeva. So Vyasadeva was called because before Kali Yuga, it was allowed that the brother could beget a child in the womb of the brother's wife. So Vichitra had departed from the world without leaving any issue. So Srila Vyasadeva was then called. Initially they had requested Bhishma to do this, but Bhishma refused because he had taken a vow of Brahmachari. But then it was found out that there was another one, another brother, Srila Vyasadeva. So Srila Vyasadeva was called for and he produced the three children. So Vidura had been driven out from the palace. In course of time, you know, Dhritarashtra had his 100 children and the eldest son, Duryodhan, was very evil and constantly plotting and planning misdeeds to do harm to the Pandavas. So Vidura tried to instruct Dhritarashtra not to be influenced by the thinking and by the behavior of his eldest son, Duryodhana. But Dhritarashtra was very attached to his sons, and he was most attached to his eldest son. The eldest son is very dear to the father. He's the representative of the father. So. Vidura tried to warn Dhritarashtra that this son of yours is no good. He's a very evil man. You should be very careful. Don't be influenced by him. But when Duryodhana heard that Vidura had been speaking like this to his father, then Duryodhana ordered Vidura, get out from our palace. Because Vidura had been staying there in the home. He'd been living with the because they were brothers. So although they had different mothers, they were from the same father. So they were like brothers. So Duryodhan ordered Vidura out from the house. He said, if you don't get out, I will beat you. So Vidura took this as the blessings of the Lord and he was happy to go out because he wanted to go and visit the holy places. And he got the opportunity. He was driven out from the palace. And where do you go when you have nowhere to stay? Well, you go to the holy places, go and visit the different ashrams, and you will always get some prasadam there and something. You know? So Vidura went out from the palace and he went to visit holy places. And he was blessed with the association of saintly people. He got the association of Uddhava, first of all. Uddhava, who had been a very dear secretary of Lord Krishna, and very intimate with Lord Krishna. So Vidura had approached Uddhava and requested Uddhava to be enlightened with spiritual knowledge. But Uddhava, although he spoke something about Lord Krishna, he told Vidura, he said, if, if he told Vidura, I said, it won't be proper etiquette for me to instruct you because there's a, a senior person nearby. Maitreya is nearby and he's senior to me. And if I instruct you in the presence of a senior person, it's a breach of etiquette. So in this way, 
Uddhava instructed Vidura, you go to Maitreya and Maitreya will give you all the knowledge because Maitreya had also been blessed with hearing the final instructions of Lord Krishna before he departed from the world. So in this way Vidura got the association of such very great saintly people and he passed many years traveling and visiting different holy places, bathing in the different ghats and holy rivers. And then, after he, he got the news about the Kurukshetra War, and he heard about how there had been an annihilation of all the Kshatriya kings practically, they'd all been killed and the Pandavas were now ruling and he heard how all the sons of Dhritarashtra had been killed. So then Vidura also got news that Dhritarashtra was still living in the palace with the Pandavas. Although Dhritarashtra had been the enemy and, and encouraged his son in their evil doings, Dhritarashtra, after his sons had all been killed, he was so blind and so attached that he remained in the palace with the Pandavas and he was eating their food and so on. So it was a very humiliating situation for Dhritarashtra. And Vidura also understood that Dhritarashtra is now in very much elderly age. He's near to the end of his life, right? We all know when we're getting near to the end of life. We see the body deteriorate. The eyes get weak. The hair falls out. It goes gray. And so many problems come with the material body. These are an indication from time that our, our time is not much left remaining in the material, this material body. So Dhritarashtra was in that condition. From his birth he had been blind and now in his old age he could not eat properly, he could not properly uh, hear things and so all of his senses have become weakened, not only his eyes, but all of his sensual power was lost. So Vidura came to talk to him that he should get out from the house. Don't remain in the house. Vidura is not able to take up bhakti yoga. You have to understand not everyone can take up bhakti yoga. Some people are just too offensive. They're just too inimical to the devotee. So Dhritarashtra was in that unfortunate condition. He wasn't able to chant the holy name. He wasn't able to worship the deities because he committed so many offenses. So it wasn't possible for him to take up bhakti yoga. And Vidura, being a, a, a great soul, he understood what, what Dhritarashtra has to do. And he tells him that you have to get out from the house. That's the first thing. If you stay at home, well, if your family are all devotees, then it's all right. But if there is no devotion at home, if the family are not in favor, then it's very difficult. Just like Srila Prabhupada. Now, Srila Prabhupada was practicing Krishna consciousness, and most of his life, he was in the family life. He had five children and he was living with his children and with his wife. He was doing some 
business to earn a livelihood, but the family were not favorable. They were not cooperative. There was always objections. And even at one point his own scriptures went missing. And he suspected that someone had taken them and sold them to get money. To buy some unnecessary items. <coughs> so Prabhupada understood it was time for him to get out from the house. One of our devotees, uh, there was this one devotee, uh, his name was Maha Vishnu Goswami. He was actually a Gujarati man, and he had joined the Krishna consciousness movement in London. Later in life, he'd also been in family life, and he came to the Krishna consciousness movement. He was previously he'd been a school teacher, and he was very learned. He studied a lot of. Uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, he's very acquainted with the, all the Srimad Bhagavatam. And he could speak very nice Sanskrit verses also. So uh, he said, because he was a Hindu in family life, he said, you should, you should, leave. when you leave the home, the family should say, where did he go? If you wait too long, the family will be asking you, when are you going? And if the family are asking you, when are you going? That's not very good. It means, you, it means you're reluctant to go. So it's better you go and they say, oh, where did he go? <laughs> so the same way Vidura is telling Dhritarashtra that you have to leave home. And he said, don't tell anyone. That's important. You, think you want to leave home. If you ask people, if you ask them, can I, can you bless me? I'm going to leave home. It won't work. It, it doesn't work that way. You ask them for permission, they'll never give you permission. You know, so, sometimes we see even young men want to come to the Krishna Consciousness Movement and they say, I will ask my family first of all, I'll just get permission from my family. So you know they'll never come because the family will never give permission for the children to become fools. And similarly, in an old age, if you're elderly and you say, I'm going to go to the holy places, I'm going to live in the temples, the family will say, oh, no, don't go, just stay here, we will take care of you, we will look after you. And you may think, oh, and you won't go. So you have to be very determined to get out from the house, you see? Because so long as you stay in the house, there's that attachment that identification with all of the things of the material world, what are described in Srimad Bhagavatam as fallible soldiers. We, we are thinking, well, I'll stay with my family, they will protect me. When I get sick, they'll take care of me, they'll take me to the doctors, or they'll give me my medicine, whatever. But the family cannot protect us, so they are called fallible soldiers. Just like the king may live with his army and his military, they are surrounding everything and protecting him. But still the king is going to die because material nature, in the laws of material nature, there are no exceptions. Whether you're the king or not, still you're subject to old age and disease and death. Inevitable death comes. And your army, your family, your servants, your money, your empire cannot protect you. So we have to recognize 
the power of the material nature and we have to make arrangements to transcend the material nature. That is the goal of life. So it requires that detachment from the material world. You have to let go of the material things. We like to hold on. We keep holding on to the material energy. We're thinking, this is mine. I have worked hard for this. But you cannot take these things with you when you leave the world. And we will all leave the world one day. So, we are reading here in Srimad Bhagavatam that one should become dira. One should become dira, sober-minded. The word, di just like Bhagavad Gita uses this word dira. Dehina smenyata dehe komaram yovanam chara tata dehantara praktir dira stachra namoyati. One who is dira is not disturbed by the changing body as we change from childhood to youth to old age. The soul similar cha changes from one body to another body. And the one who is dira, he will not be disturbed by this, these changes. So in order to detach ourselves from these things, we have to become dira. But dira is the preliminary stage to renunciation. And Srila Prabhupada goes on to talk about becoming narakama. Narakama meaning the highest, the best of men. So the best of men, they have developed their attachment for Krishna. We want to get detached from the material things, we have to hold on to the spiritual. If we want to get free from material energy and from our attachments, we can do it. But we have to hold on to the spiritual items. You have to take up the chanting and the hearing of Lord Krishna. Different spiritual uh, scriptures, just like we hear in Krishna consciousness, we read Srimad Bhagavatam. So you may be a Ram Bhakta, so you can read Ramayana. You can read Ramayana, we don't mind. You want to worship Lord Ramachandra, that's all right. Or maybe you want to worship Lord Narayan. You can also chant the Vishnu Sahasrana. You can do these things. Different processes are there. We are following the path of Krishna Bhakti, devotion to Lord Krishna. And that is described for us in the Srimad Bhagavatam by Srila Vyasadev, he has compiled this literature for the benefit of people in the Kali Yuga. Because Kali Yuga, people are very poor in their qualities. We're very weak. We're very lazy. We're very much disturbed. Srimad Bhagavatam, Srila Dev himself, describes our nature, how we are influenced by Kali Yuga. We are lazy, misguided, unlucky, and always disturbed. So this is the unfortunate situation in the Kali Yuga. But although we have very poor qualities, as far as, far as our characteristics go, they're not good, but there's one good thing about Kali Yuga, and that is described also by Srila Vyasadeva here in Srimad Bhagavatam. He says, Kalera doshini, Kalera doshini de rajan, ahe asti reko mahaguna, kirtana deva krishnasya mukta sangha parampracha. 
The, the Kali Yuga is full of dosha, faults, many faults in the Kali Yuga. Short life, I said, we're lazy, miscalled, so many things. So there are many faults in the Kali Yuga. But there's one good thing about the Kali Yuga. And that good thing is simply by chanting, you can get all perfection. If you will chant, you can get perfect. You can be saved from the influence of this Kali Yuga. Now, Dhritarashtra, he wouldn't chant. He, would, he didn't have that kind of faith. Because of all of his offenses, all of the things which he involved, been involved in dealing with the Pandavas, so it was very bad. But, you are different. You are not like Dhritarashtra, I hope. You can chant the holy name. And if you do take to this chanting, you can get all success. And this is a, a wonderful benediction. This is a blessing which we are given in this age of Kali. Although it's a fallen time, that if we will do this chanting, we will take part in this chanting, you can get all success. And even greater than just chanting Japa is to chant Sankirtan, to take part in the Sankirtan, the congregational chanting of the Holy Name. So Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Lord Krishna himself. But he comes in the Kali Yuga just to experience the pleasure of the Sankirtan. He comes to teach all of us the pleasure of the Sankirtan movement. So it's very important for us to have the Sankirtan. And you can do it anytime, any place, with anyone. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would go alone. He would go alone dancing and chanting. If there are some devotees, they will do it. They will go on their own and they will go out and chant. Different devotees, they began the preaching in different countries. They would go alone. And they just, Prabhupada said, you just take some one pair of cart out, and if you have a madanga, he says somebody else will come. You can give them the cart out, you play the drum. You can have kirtan. You can just go anywhere, public place, go in the marketplace, and chant the holy name. And people will come, they will join you and chant. The Prabhupada went to America. He went to New York and he chanted under a tree in a park. And people came and joined him. So we can also do this Sankirtan. Of course, nowadays our devotees are a bit laid back, we're not so active on Sankirtan. But when we began the Krishna Consciousness Movement, it was a regular affair. And indeed, when the devotees first came to Malaysia, they were regularly going out on Sankirtan and chanting the Holy Name. But you don't need to go out, you can do the chanting here. In the temple, you can also perform Sankirtan. It's not that you have to go out into the public to do it. Sometimes people think, oh, I don't want people to see me. If people see me chanting, they'll think strange. Okay, go so chant in the temple. Come to the temple and do the chanting. We have a nice temple here, and you can come and chant. This is the Yuga Dharma. Kali Yuga Dharma, Hari Nam Sankirtan. Krishna Shakti Vininahi Tara Prabhata. You need to get the Krishna Shakti, 
the energy of Lord Krishna can empower us to take part in the Sankirtan movement. So the Sankirtan movement is very auspicious. It creates auspiciousness. We're all worried, oh, things are so bad, the economy is falling apart, our ringgit is diminishing every day, oh, they devalue so much, so many problems, so difficult now. What to do? Well, what to do? Chant Hare Krishna. It's the best thing you can do. We can't do much else, but if you take part in the chanting of Hare Krishna, then at least you can save yourself from the inauspiciousness which is being created due to Kali Yuga, the age of Kali, the age in which people are very fallen. And don't think, well, things will get better, you just think, no, as Kali goes on, it becomes worse. It doesn't become better, although we may say, oh no, we've made so much improvement, so much advancement. We have, a, we have two bridges across to the mainland now from Penang. We've made so much progress. Is it a great advancement? Advancing to where? I don't like to say where we're advancing to. So we have to be realistic about life. And we have to understand the real value of the human life. And it requires that we should have some plan to get ourselves out from this material situation. The very culture was such that the beginning of life was meant for practicing student life, what we would call as brahmacharya, student life. You come and study in the ashram, you go to school, you go to college, right? Young people, they're all studying, you go to college, and they study, and then after they study, then they get jobs. And when they get jobs, then they get a wife, they get married, they have a family. Right? And they have a family, and gradually the children grow. The children don't stay little children. They grow up. And you then, once they're growing up, then you're, you're not, they don't need you so much. By the time the child is 15, 16, Forget it, you know, they don't look at the mother and the father, you know, they decide everything for themselves. They don't depend on the mother and father anymore. So, they grow up and then you're free. You you get to 50, half the life is over. You could never get a new job when you're 50. You know, no company will want a 50-year-old man joining their organization. Oh no, you're too old. No, we don't want you. Yeah. Then your life is over. So you, retirement is there. You're supposed to retire from the material life. But there's no retirement from the spiritual life. We give up the material life to take up the spiritual life. So the Vedic system is, you get married, you're a householder for some time, and then you detach. After Grihastha life, then next stage is Vanaprast. And the Vedas say, Pancha Sorvam Vanaprajit. From the age of 50, you should go and live in the forest. Oh no, I cannot do that. All right, then you're not, you can't go to the forest, a bit difficult, you know, we've cut down all the trees. Who wants to live in a rubber tree forest anyway, you know? Or a palm tree forest, oh my goodness. You can't eat palm fruits, nothing to eat there. So going to the forest is not very easy in this age, but you can go to the Krishna conscious centers. 
You go to the Krishna conscious centers and you take up devotional service. You get some engagement in the Krishna conscious temples. And we have centers like Mayapur and Vrindavan in holy places. You can go there and live there for the rest of your life and do service for Krishna. We have had many nice devotees do that. They will come, they will come to the Krishna conscious temples and they will do, donate their life. And even in the old age, they were there doing some kind of simple service. There are so many different things to be done in our Krishna conscious centers. So people are invited to come and do service there, live in the holy place, associate with the devotees, and constantly be hearing and chanting. So people should retire. And retirement means taking up spiritual duties. That is the vana prastha. But vana prastas can also go on and become sannyasis. They can become fully renounced and detached. Sannyasi means a dead man, a walking dead man. Sannyasi means someone who has no material responsibilities. Just, just like Srila Prabhupada took sannyas, so Prabhupada gave up the family life. After some time, he became sannyasi. He thought he was finished with the family. Although he came back to Calcutta at one point, he did not go to the family. Because he, when you take sannyas, then you don't go home. Right? You don't go back home to see the family. You leave them. Let them take care of themselves. If the family want, they can come and see. Just like Prabhupada's son, he came to see Prabhupada. But Prabhupada didn't go to see him. So that sannyas, sannyas means a walking dead man. He has no more responsibilities for the material situations. So in order to prepare for that stage, one has to practice cultivating that mood before coming to that level. You have to prepare yourself for that. You have first of all become hira. You have to become sober-minded, that you are not disturbed in different material situations. Just like devotees come to our Krishna Consciousness Movement and they do service here in our centers. So we don't pay salaries. Nobody coming here is going to become a rich man. <laughs> but they may not be rich in the material sense, but they can be rich spiritually. Because by coming here, they can hear the topics of Krishna and they can learn how to make spiritual progress and how to get freed from all their material attachments. The material attachments are the cause of all of our anxiety, all of our problems in material life because of so much attachment to the material. They have a saying in, in, in India, they say, We're, we come into this world empty-handed, and when we leave, we leave empty-handed. We don't take anything with us. But when you're born, we come in, the hand is closed. We come, the mood is, we've come to acquire, we've come to take, get it. But when we die, when we leave the world, then you open the hand. You let everything go. You cannot take anything with you. Your car, your family members, your home, you have to leave it all behind. So we have to prepare ourselves for that. And how to prepare? 
by hearing and chanting, by taking up the activities of devotion for the pleasure of Krishna. You may not have much interest to hear and chant, then at least you can do some service, what we call seva. Seva, by doing seva for the pleasure of the Lord, we can purify our heart. And particularly by joining the Sankirtana and doing chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra. All right, are there any questions? All right, everybody going to take some gas now? <laughs> Everybody's ready to leave home tonight? <laughs> don't, tell, don't tell anybody. Right? <laughs> yeah? Any question? Very good question. Thank you very much for that. Very nice. Yes, a thoughtful lady. She's thinking that what about we women? What are we supposed to do? Because ladies are not given sannyas. As Manaji said, a lady will be taken care of by others. When she's a young woman and under the care of her father, and when she's married, she's in the care of her husband, and then later in life, she's under the care of her son. So, what should a woman do? How can a woman become detached? Well, just like I said, men, they have to also, they have to hear and chant. Women also have to hear and chant. Women also have to practice devotional service. They have to come to temple and they should also do seva. They shouldn't just only cook for their family. They should come and cook for Krishna. Right? We have Panchatattva here in the temple. So you can come and help cook for Panchatattva. And we do have ladies who come and make garlands for the deities. So that's all very nice, that service for Krishna, and that is purifying, that is taking away the attachment. I know you do a lot of work at home, you're, help, you're doing so many things, cooking for the family, and doing the laundry, cleaning the house, and so many things you have to do, maybe working as well. So, you know, women are quite busy, but still, you have to find time to come to temple to do something for Krishna. Just like the men are also busy, they're also working and they're also trying to get funds and take care of their family, but they have to find time to come to temple. And gradually, as you get older, then you have to diminish, you have to make, you have to make sure you get time to come to Tampo and to, and to go to sat, uh, Satsang, to have Kirtan, and to be with other ladies, to chant and to hear. The ladies should make their own groups to discuss topics of Krishna. There are many places in the world where our devotees are, and the ladies often come together. They have the ladies program, they meet together. Because husbands are generally working, but not all ladies are working. A number of ladies are at home, and when they're at home, they do have time, and they can meet together with other ladies, and they can read the scriptures. 
And even if you, you, you may say, no, there's nobody near me, you can do it online. People get together online, just like they have these groups, you know, on, and you have WhatsApp and you have Zoom and different things. You can get groups of people together to read and to discuss. So you have to do these things. Don't think I have to be a sannyasi. No. It's not appropriate for women to go out of the house. Women should be protected. Just like cows have to be protected, ladies also have to be protected. And if, they're, if they go out like sannyasis, then they can be taken advantage of. So it's not allowed. It's not in the Vedic culture that it's not proper. And not all men have to go out of the house, but you have to consider the situation. You know, certainly, as you get older, you have to become detached. From the age of 50, you have to begin to prepare for that. And married people, what should they do? Well, the husband and wife can go together to visit the holy places. They can go to visit, just like Vidura went to the holy places, the husband and wife can go together to the holy places. And we do arrange, we arrange for groups of our devotees to go to Mayapur, and to go to Vrindavan and visit different holy places. And we take many husbands and wife couples, they will go and visit. So it's very nice. To go on. That's how you should use your life. You spend so many years here working and just making money. So in old age, you have to prepare yourself for the next life. You're preparing for the future life. And you prepare by going to visit the holy places. And if you're not going to visit the holy places, then you should come to temple and hear about the holy places. And if you don't do it, then you're just like Dhritarashtra. You're just another Dhritarashtra. It said that in, in Dhritarashtra's time there was only one Dhritarashtra, but today there are many Dhritarashtras. Every home, practically, there's a Dhritarashtra. He doesn't want to do anything, he doesn't want to chant, he won't hear the scriptures. He won't go to holy places. What does he watch television, read the newspaper, play with the mobile phone, and waste the valuable human life? So, you have a husband, you take your husband to visit holy places. That's a good thing to do. And you can spend your time in retirement to do that, to go around the holy place. You don't need to be sannyasi, but that is sannyas, actually. That mood of renunciation is there. You don't have to change the dress. It's not changing the dress, but changing the consciousness. Even you stay at home. While you're at home, the activities must be devotional. You should have a deity, and you do puja, and you do arti, you cook, and you offer the food to the deity, and in this way, you prepare yourself. Because going to holy places, we go to holy places to hear and to associate. So you can also hear at home. You can be at home and chant and hear. Yeah, thank you. So that was one question. Any other question? Nice. Yes. Nice and just now, uh, Maharaj was explaining how as a brahmacharya, as a brahmacharya, then Rasta. So many of us here, uh, we don't have a training of a brahmacharya, and similarly, we also don't have a training or understanding of uh, Rasta Ashram. And uh, nowadays, uh, I mean, 
so much uh, problem in terms of the Rasta life during and sometimes because it's a influence of the Kaliuga and also the how we have been brought up sometimes in Rasta life there's a lot of uh, uh, flickering pictures pictures between husband and wife so that sometimes they don't know how to solve it in Krishna conscious way they think that easily can go out and they can live alone because this is the how the environment molding them up so how actually we can help them be more Krishna conscious solving problem Krishna conscious before they go at the end of the life of the Dhamma well, how do we help people? Generally, we help people by association. They have to come and associate with devotees. They have to come and regularly hear from the devotees. That's it. That's it. The, the, the process by which people can make spiritual advancement. If they will come and associate regularly at the temple, then it will be very powerful, it will be very helpful for them. But if people just come, you know, they don't they don't hear, they just come and eat prasadam and go, then that's also good, but it will take a long time. It's not going to be very quick that way. You know, people come to the shop, they just want prasadam, they don't but okay, you know. But it's going to take much longer time. But if they will come, Krishna says, as you surrender to me, I reward you accordingly. So if you surrender more to Krishna, if you give more time to Krishna and service to Krishna, then Krishna will help you more. He will show you more and more what you need to do to progress. And he will send the people who can give you the great help you need to help you to really get out of this material illusion of enjoying the material world. So it's so important to get association. You have to come to the temple, you have to be regular, come. And you know, you can associate also, of course, we have, as I said, mobile networks. You can associate regularly through the internet. We have so many courses also now. That's you're all encouraged to take some course and study the philosophy. For example, we have the Bhakti Shastri course. Very good for everyone. Study the Bhagavad Gita and the nectar of devotion, nectar of instruction, initial punishment. We have classes like, you can get different structures. Some classes are like two days, two mornings a week, or maybe two evenings a week. And you do the course regularly for several months. The course may take a year or two years now. But you're hearing regularly and you know, you get some assignments to do also. It's very nice to study and to discuss the different teachings of the scriptures. So that's very good for devotees. We have courses in China, for example, because in China we have a lot of elderly people. So we have something called Wangne Dashi. Wrong in Russia, old people's university. <laughs> and I know they, they, they like it very much, you know, because an elderly person is teaching them and they, let, they, feel, they, they feel they're being cared for. That because they're elderly people, so they don't pick up things so quickly, the new devotees, but they're hearing. And that way they're, they're benefiting, they're getting purified. So it's important. Every day you want to hear, every morning we have classes, every morning, right? Nimitima, Nitin Zarsha, Nimitin Kama. Huh? 
Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much, Maharaj, for the wonderful discourse. And also, I would like to ask the devotees to chant Hare Bo! Hare Bo! Hare Bo! Hare Bo! So, uh, Maharaj, we'll give some. 